The music business started out small in New York City, mostly pieces for church services or popular songs like Camp Town Races by Stephen Foster in the 1850s. Music was something you heard when you went to the theater, so there was no reason to go out and buy it. Before the 19th century, there was no real sheet music industry, there was no recording industry, certainly there was no radio. And the big change was mass production. The same way American factories were turning out plows and sewing machines, by 1890, cheap, upright pianos were in millions of homes, saloons, and even ice cream parlors. People needed something to play. And with it came this idea that you could mass produce sheet music like newspapers and like magazines, like other things that were printed. Music really could be something like a business rather than something that just a few people knew about. A new industry was born on the streets of Manhattan. Merchants who'd sold women's clothing the year before realized there was a lot more money in the music trade. If I can sell a corset, said one of them, I can sell a song. They became music publishers, and by 1900, dozens of them were side by side on West 28th Street between 6th Avenue and Broadway. The phrase Tin Pan Alley is often used to describe popular songwriting and popular music. A lot of people don't realize that it actually was a real place, this very block of 28th Street. We're assaulted right now by the traffic, but right. I guess at that time it was a different sound. Right. You would have heard a lot of new songs um, being, being tested. Every music publisher on the block had what was known as a song demonstrator. He would have been pounding out new songs on these cheap pianos. To one observer, it sounded like a lot of tin pans. That was how Tin Pan Alley got its name. So would I have seen performers or reps for them walking down the street listening to potential hits? Yes. As a matter of fact, this was the theatrical district at the time, and many vaudevillians congregated here. Vaudeville was a many different acts on a bill. You had singers, dancers, eccentric people. Uh, it, it was a whole show. So to have a new song introduced by one of these great stars like Al Jolson or Eddie Canner, the public just went wild for this. Now he's getting out, I Vince Giordano leads the Nighthawks, a band that specializes in the music of the 1920s and 30s. By the time Prohibition hit, Tin Pan Alley had published tens of thousands of songs. Since the key was getting a song heard by the public, music publishers would hire people known as song pluggers. A song plugger would go to the theaters and he would wait for whatever singers were on the show in the, at a vaudeville house. And as they would come out, they would pester them and say, hey, you got to hear this. Hey, I got a song for you, Joe. They would grab a hold of them and just pester them and bug them to do this, this, this song because this is the greatest song ever written. This one's perfect for you. They had a whole bunch of baloney <laughs> that they would keep using over and over again. See, how are you going to miss with a tune like that? Dave, from the heart. Terrible. Song plugging was a way to break into the music business, and a couple of talented teenagers named George Gershwin and Irving Berlin started that way. Irving Berlin is an interesting case. He went to theaters and pretending to be a member of the audience, and he would demand a song or he would ask a song to be repeated. Nobody really realized he was being paid by the publishers. But that's how they all learned what they were doing. Recordings and player piano rolls were helping to push the music business to new heights. Now you could buy a piano that played the latest hits all by itself. Music poured out of Tin Pan Alley into the Tenderloin, a red light district that surrounded it. Here on West 28th Street is a ghost of that time, a former gambling house run by a gangster named Shang Draper. Shang Draper had been one of the most successful bank robbers in the 1870s and made a huge amount of money. And then he took this house over and it really prospered. So who would have come and gone through this building? 
Many different types of people. You would have had performers who congregated at the Tin Pan Alley publishing offices. Uh -huh. Tin Pan Alley and this type of gambling house were part of the same large tenderloin world. Walking up the back stairs of Shang Draper's elegant club, the latest songs would have drifted up through the walls, from the music publishers outside and from inside the building as well. Most saloons and gambling houses hired a piano player to keep the customers happy. The whole purpose for the songwriter was to get the song heard by as many people as possible. So the gamblers who came here as part of the tenderloin industry could be counted on to hear a song and then take it with them back to wherever it was they came from. As the theater district and their stars moved towards Times Square, the music publishers followed, leaving 28th Street for offices further north. But the name Tin Pan Alley stuck to the business of writing pop music for a mass market.